Nothing is good at everything, and SpaceX's Starship is no exception. It promises to be the world's first fully reusable launch system, the most powerful rocket ever built, over 100 tons of payload capacity. It is an amazing piece of technology that will probably revolutionize the launch industry. But it has a little bit of an Achilles heel, high energy orbits. In this great video, which served as an inspiration and jumping off point for this one, Eager Space shows that despite being several times the size of Falcon Heavy, Starship's payload capacity to GTO, or Geostationary Transfer Orbit, is actually less than its younger relative. Today, I want to not only address why that is, but also what steps SpaceX might be able to take to improve it. So let's get started. To understand what is going on with Starship, we need to address the elephant in the room. Reusability. From the ground up, Starship was designed to be a fully reusable launch system. In order to accomplish that, the ship not only needs to survive the grueling conditions of re-entry, but also needs some degree of aerodynamic control and enough propellant to execute its famous flip maneuver for landing. All of that adds mass, and not a small amount either. This of course eats into the payload capacity of the rocket. Okay, so if it's 30 tons of mass dedicated to reuse hardware, why then is the payload drop-off so extreme? Shouldn't it just be the extra fuel needed plus the 30 tons? Well, my friend, you have fallen for one of the classic blunders, the most famous of which is to never get involved in a land war in Asia, but only slightly less well known is to never assume a relationship in spaceflight is linear. Alright, to find Starship's payload capacity, we will use the mass ratio function that equates delta V to the effective exhaust velocity multiplied by the natural log of a vehicle's wet mass over its dry mass, with effective exhaust velocity being equal to ISP times the standard gravity of Earth, or about 9.8 meters per second per second. Alright, so let's start filling this in. We know a sea level raptor has an ISP of about 350 seconds and the vacuum version has roughly 380 seconds. Since the each ship has three of each, we can average the difference and assume Starship's ISP is approximately 365. Next, gravity is 9.8 and 0.665 meters per second squared. Easy. These last two terms are where we have some issues. Since Starship is a privately developed vehicle, there is a lot we don't know about it. How much the ship weighs is one of them. So these numbers are just speculation with kind of a few truths sprinkled in there. But for the purpose of today's video, we are going to be assuming that Starship has a maximum wet mass in orbit of about 251 tons and a dry mass of 120 tons. Okay, so with all that, we get this graph. The vertical axes represent Starship's payload capacity, whereas the horizontal axes represents delta V. This thing is calibrated to a roughly 200 by 200 kilometer orbit, so the y-intercept is the amount of mass the ship could deliver to that orbit, in this case roughly 130 tons. Now if we wanted to go to a more energetic orbit by accelerating by about a thousand meters a second, you can see that our payload capacity had dropped to only 69 tons. Now if you look at GTO, which requires at an absolute minimum about 2400 meters a second of delta V, you can see that the payload has gotten scarily close to zero. Call it maybe 7 tons. That's about as much as a Falcon 9 can do. Now it is important to note that these numbers are always going to be a little different than other people's, and that is just because we have made different assumptions about Starship's mass, and, and maybe compared a different version, you know, Block 2, Block 3, Block 1, you know, etc. But at the end of the day, SpaceX are the only ones who truly know. You can feel free to complain in the comments and I'll try to, I'll try to defend myself. But anyway, these numbers are pretty bad, you know, like the biggest rock in the world can't even deliver anything to GTO? Inconceivable. We need to do something about this. Let's take a look at our graph and see how we can shift this curve. So to start off with gravity, unless we are suddenly able to turn Earth into Mars, I, I, I don't think we can do anything about that. That leaves us with ISP, wet mass, and dry mass. In practical terms, that means we need to either make the engines more efficient, add more propellant, or make the ship lighter. Let's work backwards and see what SpaceX can do to improve each of these metrics, starting by making the ship lighter. So we can begin over here at the heat shield, and well, we're always going to need a heat shield, so maybe, well, how about the flaps? I guess we can maybe make them a little smaller, but they seem pretty important. Mm. Okay then, well, what about the landing legs? 
No, no, you. We can't just get rid of the landing legs. That would. Hey, wait a minute. Now, since we have never seen a real landing leg design for Starship, it's hard to estimate how much mass they saved by removing them, but let's be conservative and say the savings are about 2.5 tons per vehicle. Now, I know I said no relationship is spaceflight and linear, but in this case, it is 2.5 tons off the dry mass gives us 2.5 tons more propellant for pretty much any orbit. There are obviously other benefits I'm not discussing, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Now, I I know this being linear is, is quite ironic considering what I said a few minutes ago, but we're going to ignore that because I wanted to say the land war in Asia thing. So continuing, let's um let's let's keep moving up the list here. So the next thing we can do is to add propellant to increase the wet mass. If you've seen SpaceX's plans for Starship Block 3, then you will know that they plan to do this a lot. And by a lot, I mean adding roughly 800 tons of propellant compared to Block 2, the version the original numbers you're looking at here are based on. Because the Block 3 ship is much longer, we should also expect a slight increase in dry mass. Call it maybe 40 tons. So let's plug those numbers into our equation and see what we get. Wow, that is a massive difference. We can see that the payload to LEO has jumped all the way up to 221 tons, while the GTO payload is now an impressive 34 tons. No matter how ugly you think Starship 3 is, you certainly can't deny it's a very capable rocket. Alright, so now we can move on to our last option, increasing Raptor's efficiency. Adding extra vacuum Raptors will increase the average ISP of the stage, but the effect isn't super huge, so we're going to skip all that and talk about something a lot more interesting, kick stages. From what I understand, there have been what you might call concepts of plans for Starship kick stages, but I'm going to ignore all those and just invent things out of my imagination because, hey, it's more fun. So let's take a super efficient engine, maybe an RL-10 with its 465 and a half seconds of ISP. Now, we can assume the stage has a dry mass of about mm, 3 tons, and that is pretty similar to the Centaur that flies on the Atlas V and Vulcan, so let's plot that out and see what we get. Well, okay then. Our GTO payload has gone from an itty bitty 7 tons to a pretty respectable 74 tons. That is, that is not bad at all. Something that's interesting to note, by the way, is this intersection point right here. This is the point at which it becomes more efficient to use a block 2 stage with a kick stage versus a block 3 one without. And just for the fun of it, let's put our fun new kick stage onto a block 3 starship. Alright, that's kind of a mess of a curve, so let's simplify it to just the kick stages. So now, our GTO payload is up to 126 tons, which is almost as much as a Saturn V's LEO capacity, which is a, a little nuts. On a side note, by the way, this is why Falcon 9 deploys Starlings into orbits between 200 and 250 kilometers, even though their operational orbits are over 500 kilometers up. It is much more efficient to have the Starlink use their 2,500 plus ISP onboard Argon Hall thrusters to raise their orbits than the Merlin on Falcon. Now, before we end, there is one more thing we need to consider, and that is reusability which is a great thing for cost savings, but can kind of be a thorn in your side because for Starship, everything has to be reused, including, presumably, the kick stage. So after payload deployment, the now mostly empty kick stage would have to re-lower its orbit and rendezvous with the ship so it can enter into the cargo bay and be recovered with the ship. For a GTO mission, this means the kick stage actually needs about twice as much Delta V as we originally planned. There is a major caveat though. After it deploys the payload, the stage becomes significantly lighter and therefore gets way more delta V for the same propellant. After doing a little math, I determined that the kick stage would need no more than about 5 tons of extra propellant. This cuts our Block 2 GTO capacity down from 74 to 69 tons, and our Block 3 capacity down from 126 to 121. So not too bad. So after all that, what can we conclude? Well, first of all, kick stages and stretch Starship seems like very good ideas. If you do both, it's theoretically possible to get Starship for being able to deliver 7 tons to GTO up to over 120 tons. Secondly, reducing Starship's dry mass will only yield limited benefits, especially considering you can only reduce Starship's dry mass so much before you have to start making some serious breakthroughs in material science which could be a fun topic for a different video, but for today, we are just about out of time. 
So with that, I'd like to say thank you for watching. Please write a comment to this video. Once again, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. And bye.